Boldwood Presents, Right Behind You. Written by Diana Wilkinson and read by Antonia Beamish. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue The Garden Shed My outward appearance resembles that of a carefully mown and manicured Wimbledon lawn, pristine, clipped and ready for action, not a weed in sight. Bring on the players. I perfect the look with an air of crisp efficiency. People imagine the foundations, the layers underneath my manufactured guise, to be solid and hard-earned, a person of substance. How do I know? Because I'm treated with respect due from such summations. I read people well, but they have no idea who I really am, or what lies beneath. Below this surface mantle, there are no soft silts and sands, no gentle, porous foundations. My life has no rich, varied layers of experience. Below the smell of freshly cut grass, a giant batholith lies embedded in my core. I was only ten when this black mass of spewing magma exploded through my being, killing off everything in its wake, and its slumbers, dangerously close to the surface, threatening to expose itself at any time as life erodes its delicate casing. Meanwhile, I pretend. I pretend all is right with the world. I keep the facade firmly in place to fool those around me. I know I mustn't tell, but I can't forget. I remember every detail. It never goes away. It's the pendulous jowls and wet, salivating lips. That's what I see. The thin veneer of sweat coating the fat alabaster face is what I smell. The sweet, cloying stench still hangs heavy in the air. It clung to my pores long after the scalding showers scorched my body, and I'm still not clean, my nostrils thick with memories. The garden shed was coloured a faded apple green. Flakes of paint rained to the ground when the door was yanked open. Green snowflakes, he laughed. Look! His eyes shriveled black raisins in a wobbly jelly, glanced briefly down at the ragged chips, but he was too eager to get inside. There was no time to linger. The inside was kitted out like a 1960s sitting room. A drop-leaf table was pushed tight against the damp, rotting slats. It would be opened once he'd caught his breath. Crisps and custard creams blackmailing my silence. A two-seat sofa was wedged against the walls and bolstered up the flimsy structure. There was nowhere else to sit. I willed the walls to crumble, bury the shame. Net curtains stapled in place sealed us off from the outside world. Thick dirt was so ingrained it had solidified and ensured the flimsy material wouldn't budge. The floral chipped teacups and sugar tongs teased with homeliness, and I often wonder where he got his props. The room smelt of urine, sweat, and old age, and death. Cobwebs decorated the corners with neatly spun gossamer threads. That's how they looked when I walked in the first time, having been enticed with sweets and treats. But the black, hairy arachnids lay in wait, teasing with their silky perfection. That's the way clever predators operate. They lure the unsuspecting with illusory delights. But the spiders didn't hang about. They scuttled off, disseminating their pristine homes when his blubbery white hide appeared and wobbled in excitement. It wasn't long until I began to change my route home from school. Left down Burton Avenue, right into Salisbury Road, and third left into Park Lane. At the main road, I would scamper across when the lights turned green. I tried not to look panicked in case anyone intervened. I measured my pace. He might be there, sitting on a bench, watching me. Remember, 
It's our little secret. You mustn't tell. A waggling, admonishing finger kept me quiet. Then I would hurry on through the park, not daring to look back. My heart hammered in my chest, beating like a kettle drum. But there was no escape, no matter how fast I ran or how hard. Five more minutes and I'd be home. I counted the numbers backwards from 300. That was on a Monday. On Tuesday, I took the direct route and avoided the park. Wednesday, I spun a coin. Thursday was games afternoon, so I got dropped off. On Fridays, there was nowhere to run. He only worked a four-day week and would be waiting for me. Fun Friday, he called it, and he was never late. He became my stalker. I learnt the word later when it needed no explanation. My anxious alertness turned quickly to fear and then to terror. I became a prisoner in my own skin, the invisible walls impenetrable. He was everywhere all day and all night, watching and waiting. Boo! There you are. I wondered where you'd gone. The tree trunk wasn't wide enough. I'd seen him, but I wasn't fast enough. Again, it was too late when I walked in and he was chatting to the shopkeeper, soft candy grasped in fat sausage fingers. Here, do you fancy some? My treat. But worst of all was the nightmarish anticipation of Fridays. There was one at the end of every week. Hi, Snippet. Let me walk you home. I could do with the company. He called me Snippet. It was his pet name. It rhymed with Whippet, his scrawny breed of dog. We were both thin and wiry and got patted on the head. He'd come to school and chat merrily to a teacher, blocking the exit gates. His sweaty palm would grip mine tightly all the way back and he would only let go when he loosened his belt and unzipped his trousers. By then, we'd be inside, the door locked behind us. It was the stalking that left the scars, the deepest gullies. His death brought a joyous finality to the physical torture, a fleeting release. Outside, through the newly barred windows of the shed, his roomy, watery eyes glistened through a small rip in the curtains. They made a silent, unblinking plea, easy to ignore. Instead, I smiled back, waved my skinny fingers and skipped away. I was barely thirteen, after all, not quite done with skipping. But I still look over my shoulder. Sleep eludes me. When I try to eat, my food tastes of vomit mingled with a sticky sweetness. My senses are full, full of sounds, sights and tastes, but without the pleasure. The joy of touch eludes me. The flaccid monster that grew and grew in my hand the big friendly giant saw to that. I should have told. It was my own fault. Not his death, but the not telling. But I was only ten when it all began. Who would have listened? My age and innocence flew quickly by. But after his death, I learnt to keep the illusion in place, skilfully, and for long enough so that no one would think me capable of murder. It never crossed their minds. My stalker was Uncle Chuck Curry. Chuckles to his friends. The big, fat, happy clown. He only lived two roads away and was my mother's stepbrother, the perfect babysitter. A wolf in sheep's clothing. That was Uncle Chuck, the harmless, cheerful buffoon. His appearance was his disguise. He nurtured the look with jam and cream doughnuts. What wasn't to like? And then, of course, he warned me not to tell. If I did, he'd lock me in the shed and throw away the key. Chapter One Six Months Previously I feel as if I'm in an isolation bunker, the chill in the air quite deathly, the flesh along both arms is stippled with pimples. It's as if the world has come to an end, but with foresight... I've been clever enough to brick myself in. The concrete stairwell is positively empty. I'm not surprised as I pinch my nose against the rank stench of urine. Yellow stains clog up the corners 
and remnants of rancid hamburger baps exude stale fumes. I shiver, fearful of breathing in the toxic mix. No one else is risking the fallout. Tucked neatly behind the swing doors at the top, three flights up, my ears are primed against the slightest noise. Through the thick swing doors, I pick up the faintest of buzzing. It's the office workers moseying around the lifts, talking in hushed voices, waiting for the tin cubicles to ferry them back down to the car park and ground zero. Their laziness plays into my hands, because no one bothers to descend on foot. They never do. If I'm right, she'll be the only one to turn up. It's been roughly three months since I heard about her impending baby. Thinking about it still makes me mad, leaving me unable to unlock my jawline, which is clenched day and night. My fury is sealed within for the whole 24 hours of each day. Suddenly, the swing doors open slightly, and my hand shoots out flat against the wall to steady myself, but they close again and no one appears. Retreating voices fade as the clatter of metal heralds the arrival of the lift. Fate has played into my hands as they must have decided against the exercise. My heart threatens to crack its confines, and a few seconds pass before I manage a deep breath to slow its rhythm. My watch shows it's still only ten past five. I have six minutes left to wait. She's that regular. At the end of the working day, there are lots of random people who head purposefully towards the underground car park, where their vehicles are squeezed into obscenely tight spaces. Random is a good word. It smacks of chance. The coincidental angle needs to be watertight. Today, I am just another random person, out and about. Coincidence alone can't put me in prison. Poor Danielle has had her wing mirrors clipped more than once. I'm surprised she doesn't rein them in. She still refuses to leave her car near the CCTV cameras to find out who is causing the damage, and insists on being as close as possible to the stairwell entrance. This suits me fine. Using the lift for her is never an option. She suffers from claustrophobia, avoiding confined spaces, always on the lookout for an escape route. Suddenly, at 5.16pm, the steel doors push open again, but this time more widely. Quiet as a mouse, prepared to scuttle away once the coast is clear, my ears prick up, wide eyes devour the spectacle. Swollen feet make her waddle like a duck. Her ankles are retaining water. It's most unattractive, and the baby bump bulges through the tight outline of her sheer blue dress, which hangs below her calves. The fact that she's displaying the bump so blatantly, a boastful statement, hardens my resolve. Her swollen breasts strain provocatively. My anger and loathing make me want to break cover and spit in her face. But I don't. I watch and wait. Like a teetering toddler, she takes a tentative step towards the banister and extends her right hand to grip the metal. Her left hand is holding firmly onto a soft leather laptop case, but she doesn't reach the banister. I watch, agog, as her foot gives way, and her tumbling body begins a heavy descent over the cold slabs. Piercing screams follow, and my hands automatically reach up to cover my ears. Wow! I wasn't expecting such a display. She looks like a tumbling cheese in one of those country fair competitions, turning over and over until coming to a rest at the bottom of a steep hill. It's very startling. For a moment, I'm tempted to run down the stairs and offer help, as the squeals are deafening and she seems in so much pain. But I can't alert anyone that I'm close by. That might make the stalking issue a criminal offence, and I have no intention of being punished for being an innocent bystander so I slink away. I slide gently through the thick doors and walk quietly towards the lifts, head down. My soft leather pumps don't make a noise and I melt easily into the waiting queue. All eyes are steeled forward and no one looks in my direction. Strange, though, that no one seems to hear the screams, but perhaps I'm imagining that they're still audible. 
as there's a definite ringing in my ears. The lift doors creak open and, swallowed up by office workers, I'm shoved to the back of the tin cubicle. We are like sardines in a can. Two young girls step back when someone indicates that the occupancy limit is eight people. Perhaps in their statements when they come forward as being present on the day of the incident, they will recall how they were asked to wait for the next lift. An obese man, his body sweat engulfing us all with its putrid excretions, insists they wait. I can't help thinking that if he got out, an extra four people could get in. On another day, I might have dared to point this out. As the doors finally close, I find myself crushed between two suited men, wrapped in serious low-toned conversation, humming with importance, and I close my eyes tight as the lift chugs slowly downwards. I try to think of what I might cook for supper, what I might watch on television. You see, like the tumbling cheese, I'm not a fan of enclosed spaces. At ground level, we all spill out of the lift and head off in different directions, casually walking past paramedics who are already on the scene. They must have been close by. A blue light flashes silently, steadily, on top of an ambulance whose back doors are flung wide. A flustered medic is talking into a handset, relaying details of the incident, and is ordering a stretcher to be lifted out. No one stops and asks what's happened, which is strange. If I didn't already know, I'm sure I would have stopped. However, this works in my favour, as no one takes any notice of me either, everyone keeping their eyes down, glad not to be part of an unfolding drama. It's too late in the working day. I weave in and out of the line of all the CCTV cameras like a speeding motorist jumping lanes with a plomb until I'm back out on the street. It is part of a ritual to note where the snooping monitors are placed and I'm adept at avoiding their Big Brother recordings and today I'm confident that my image won't be flagged up. Yet if my face does get captured and I've missed one or someone vaguely remembers me, my testimony will claim coincidence. I happened to be shopping in the vicinity at the time, that's all. I have several receipts from the adjoining mall stowed away safely in my handbag. As I reach the tube and begin my descent into the bowels of the earth, at last breathing more easily, I remind myself that I didn't go near or speak to the woman who fell. She wouldn't have recognised me even if I had. Long gone is my dejected air and sunken cheekbones. The leggings and baggy shirts have been replaced by designer chic and my straggling locks have been shorn. If she did glimpse me, she would have seen a stranger. It has all been a matter of coincidence. Chapter 2 Present Day I'm lying prostrate on the therapist's couch, like a patient waiting for a massage to begin. I'm fully dressed, but the aim will be to strip my soul bare. This woman, though, isn't into gentle manipulation, but rather into kneading deep tissue knots embedded savagely along the spine, accompanied by hands-on aggressive probing. Names, she begins. Pause. Do these men have names? She peers at me over the top of her half-moon glasses, tempting me to respond using the severity of her stare as a challenge. With eyes closed, I hope she'll be fooled into believing that I'm considering a carefully constructed and thoughtful answer. It's the way the questions are phrased that rankles. Sarcasm oozes from the single opening word, names. My knee-jerk reaction is to say, no, they don't have names. One went by the letter X, one by Y, and then there was Z. But I don't. I hide my irritation and decide to play fair. The sooner we get it over with, the sooner I can escape. Jeremy is a name I think you mentioned before. This is followed by a meaningful silence. My left eyelid peels gently back and through the narrow slit, I see my interrogator twirl the end of a pen round in her mouth. 
She has checked her notes to find the name and is sitting patiently. I've heard somewhere that's what therapists do. Ask a question, wait quietly and bore their clients into responding. It's an easy way to earn money. Yes, I say. Jeremy, how could I forget? He was my first love. The deepest cut is what they call it. At the time, he could do no wrong. Or let me rephrase that. I believed he could do no wrong. I conjure up his face, the beautiful, perfect features. Only a woman in love would call them perfect. His nose was slightly hooked, his lips well-formed but rather thin, and the third tooth on the right overlapped its neighbour, giving rise to an endearing lisp. Endearing at first, irritating in retrospect. What happened? She's going to pick at the sores, try to find out what makes me tick and why a restraining order has been slapped on such an innocent-looking young woman. Silence. I have all the time in the world. Outside, the birds are tweeting, cheerful background music. The large sash window is ajar, letting in the fast, warm, wafting breeze of summer. Early June, my favourite month. A thick red book, a tome by Freud or Pavlov, no doubt, holds it open, jammed in at one end. Perhaps the cord has snapped. Nothing much, really. He went off with someone else. It sounds so simple, so normal, but I'm not going to own up to the shock I felt on discovering that he'd been sleeping with three women at the same time. We were young. I continue, reluctantly, as I scan the room through lazy eyes. Bookshelves line the walls and stretch heavenward towards corniced ceilings. Psychotherapists must be well paid. Did you feel betrayed? She asks, her voice soft and marshmallowy. A strange question, really. At the time, I kept going back for more, disbelieving and listening to the excuses, desperate for a few crumbs of encouragement. I used to ask him questions, willing the truth to set me free, but he wasn't that noble. He was the first guy, since my father, that I couldn't let go. The worse Jeremy treated me, the more determined I got to hold on. The more elusive, the more driven I was to see him. Stalking isn't a word I would use. I was keen to catch him out, so I followed him around, day and night, until he disappeared. A complete bastard. Thinking out loud, I'm shocked by the venom in the three words, and wonder if the excavation of my soul might be starting to bear fruit, finally revealing its hidden depths. I know that's what Ms Evans is digging for. In what way? A neatly shaped eyebrow raises. Miss, or perhaps to be more accurate, Ms Justine Evans, as depicted on the gold-embossed nameplate, asks questions for a living, I have a few questions I'm tempted to throw her way. For example, portraying single status for professional purposes gives me a clue as to her character. She doesn't want to be defined by marriage. She likes to play act that she's single, and it's tempting to ask why. He wouldn't phone for several days, and this would force me to turn up at his flat very late at night, banging loudly to be let in. It was his fault entirely that I was forced to hang around outside and lose what dignity I had left. Following him every day to work might have been a bit over the top, but I was in love, and when he told me to back off, it only made things worse. He forced you. To turn up like that, I mean. Ms Evans, call me Justine, is trying to pass the blame my way, make me own up to being desperate and neurotic, perhaps slightly unhinged. Ms Evans has a plan, but then so have I. Perhaps that's a bit harsh, but we were virtually living together, so I would expect to see him at the end of the day. My smile is like a politician's, a fixed grin, set firm, to sell my pitch. As his girlfriend, 
Jeremy had sworn undying love within the first three weeks of hooking up, and I took it for granted that we would end up together. Together forever. We kept moving through difficult phases in our relationship, that was all, or so I told myself. Miss Evans will guess I'm lying. We lived in two separate flats a couple of miles apart, and even after a year, Jeremy showed determined reluctance to move in together. In fact, to do anything together anymore. What about the sex? Miss Evans' lips have a gentle upturn at the corners. The clock is ticking onwards, and my one-hour slot is nearly up. Although I'm being treated like a sick criminal, I think it's quite amazing that the cost of my treatment is being funded by some governmental body, probably a specially set-up unit for the criminally insane. And that was the hardest thing to give up. This is what she's expecting to hear. I don't disappoint. Miss Evans's legs are neatly crossed, silken, nude-coloured stockings giving a hint of an inner sexuality. I wonder when she might uncross them, and for what sort of clients. I suspect sex is a major topic on most of her questionnaires, and maybe the answers get her excited. Was it special? What does she mean, special? We had been lock and key, first-time lovers who couldn't get enough of each other. Several times a day, inside and out, upstairs and down, covertly and brazenly. Isn't that how it is with all first-time lovers? la di da di da I thought so. Before we round off our session, perhaps you can tell me how you finally accepted the end of the relationship. This will be central to her inquiries. Once a stalker, always a stalker. I didn't. He disappeared off to America and I've never been able to track him down. I did try, but eventually out of sight, out of mind. This is something else she needs to believe. My ability to move on. I don't tell her about the fury, hurt and devastation that clung to me after he left, clothed in a cloak of self-loathing and failure. I spent day and night trying to track him down, not to mention the three futile trips to the States. A blackness suffocated my soul until I met Scott. Next time we can perhaps talk a little bit about Scott. He was your saviour? I think you called him? She smiles, but again I sense sarcasm lurking below the measured statement. Scott is the reason I'm here, so I knew she wouldn't want to waste too much time on his predecessor. I met him on the rebound. He treated me even worse than Jeremy. A tinny laugh pops out, accompanied by a distinct puff of disbelief. Puff the magic dragon. Okay. Next week, you can tell me all about Scott. As her notebook closes, an acknowledgement that the session is over, a crinkly smile replaces the professional mask. Standing up straight, I flick back my hair in an act of defiance and pass the buck firmly towards my interrogator. I've no idea why Scott has had a restraining order slapped on me, as I wouldn't go within a hundred miles of him. No need to tell her about my plans. Without reply, the prim consultant opens her desk diary and pencils me in for the same time next week. I thank her, but unsure for what. When I leave, Miss Evans dictates her conclusions into the little dictaphone on her desk and her secretary types up a report, which gets sent off to all interested parties. That is, all parties interested in my psychotic and unbalanced state of mind – not to mention those footing the bill. I close the door quietly behind me and wander out through the ornate portico entrance, pleasantly calm and weirdly refreshed from the lie-down, and head back out into the sunshine. I glance heavenward, pause, and let the heat seep through my pores. I trace the winding path back towards the road, through the carefully manicured grounds, with the mature stately trees lining the route. The Abbott Hospital grounds have the distinct feel of an upmarket stately home. Luxury and insanity nestle side by side. An unlikely union. 
Up ahead, a thin, wiry man pushing a bicycle approaches. He's not dressed in striped pyjamas and isn't wandering haphazardly in a delusional, psychotic state. That's the thing with mental issues. They're hard to spot. But this guy, Bob Pratchett, is a regular. Hi, all OK? He pulls up alongside, his smile beaming like a toothpaste advert. It's a bright, overly forced, see-how-at-ease-I-am-with-the-world kind of smile, yet his round shoulders and fidgeting fingers suggest that he's anything but. Hi, I survived, I say. Bob is wearing a weird baseball hat, askew at an angle, with Boston Red Sox emblazoned in red across the brim. His mouth displays small, perfectly formed pebbles for teeth, but his lips are wet. Small spots of saliva congealed in the corners. He's like a salivating mongrel, rabid and malnourished. Perhaps you fancy a coffee sometime. We could swap stories and perhaps tell each other the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. His hearty laugh convulses his body as he makes the courtroom pronouncement. Sounds good, I lie. Don't talk to anyone from the Abbott Hospital. They're all mad. Walk straight on past. My mother's warning is still with me, even after all these years. She wasn't quite so vehement, though, after the beatings sent her scrambling through the wrought iron gates in search of drugs and a sympathetic ear to ease her torment. Mental illness is something horrendous that happens to other people, she told me. Her assurances and smile convinced me that this was indeed the case. Great, let me know when suits. With that, Bob pushes his bike on past, whistling a distinct, triumphant ditty. See you later, he calls over his shoulder. When I reach the end of the driveway, I stop and look across the road at my childhood home. A chill shiver runs down my spine. The sun has dipped behind a cloud, hiding under a large, fluffy map of Australia and has taken the heat with it. It's hard not to remember what happened. Even my determination to gut, cleanse and rebuild the interior of my household legacy can't wipe away the memories. As I wait for a break in the traffic, I wonder if I should invite Ms Evans across to my home one day. She could witness firsthand the source of my discontent, where it all began and perhaps where it's all likely to end. It might help with the answers. My therapist will soon start probing, digging deeper into my family past. Her concentration will be on my violent alcoholic father and my neurotic, drug-addled mother. She will try to make me accept that my parents are to blame for my sick, unhinged behaviour. Opening up and talking about them should help me address the issues and lead to a cleansing of the soul. I know the terminology. She believes my parents are at the root of all my problems, and who am I to disagree? As I step out into the road, a car horn blasts through the air. Shit! I automatically reel backwards, catapulted out of my reverie. A large black Range Rover misses me by inches as it swerves across the white line. I am a black cat. I have nine lives. My mother told me she had nine lives. I scuttle across to the other side. And pray I'm that lucky. Chapter 3 Covent Garden is packed, but then it's a Friday. End of the week. Time to let the hair down. The milling throngs have been my camouflage. I've wafted in and out unnoticed for the past few weeks, floating by like a soft breeze. But today I will emerge, a phoenix rising from the ashes. The café where I've settled is a small French bistro. Tables and chairs are slotted neatly into the confined outside space. I'm sitting at a table for two, having swivelled my chair round, strategically pointing it to face the length of pavement he walks every Friday for his lunchtime session. He won't be able to go past without spotting me. The sun is directly overhead, but under the striped awning there is a welcome shade. I remove my hat, Audrey Hepburn chic, 
and lay it carefully on top of the red and white checkered tablecloth. Today has been a long time coming, but it has finally arrived. My patience rewarded. Then I see him as he turns the corner and heads in my direction. His hands are casually tucked into his pockets and sunglasses perch on top of his blonde wavy hair. Oakley's. Only the best for Scott. Suddenly his pace falters, as if everything has gone into slow motion. For one awful moment, I think he might turn round and go back the way he's come, but he doesn't. His hands hang by his side, the casual air replaced by unease and a furrowed brow. I hold my breath, still as a canny predator, and watch. I feign sudden recognition and spring up in my seat. After months of planning, Scott is in front of me, staring as if at a ghost, face to face at last. Pistols at dawn. Oh my God, Scott! My face reddens. The heat is helping my meticulously rehearsed embarrassment as a creeping swathe of crimson sweeps across my cheeks. Beverly? Perhaps he isn't sure if it is really me. The wanton curls and weight loss might be bolstering his surprise, but there's an unmistakable element of shock in his intonation. I suspect he's praying that he might be wrong. What are you doing here? My eyes are wide and my mouth agape. I've been practising in the mirror, perfecting the look of surprise. Oh my God, I repeat. Is it really you? I push back my chair, standing up to proffer the customary kiss on both cheeks, as would be expected between old friends and ex-lovers. I've toyed with the gesture, wondering whether it might not be better to let him take the lead, but decided that a coincidental meeting requires knee-jerk reactions, nothing stilted. The staged coincidence needs to be convincing. I work round the corner, he says, but then you know that. Are you still at the bank? It's great to see you. It seems ages. How long has it been? A while. Deadpan. Not a smile, nor flicker of emotion. Here, sit down, have a drink. Old time's sake. I lift my handbag off the spare chair and pat the seat. One can't hurt, surely. He hesitates. My surmise was that he would be curious, anxious, and perhaps afraid that the meeting was orchestrated, but he'll need to find out. My next comment helps him make the decision. It's weird, but I thought I spotted you earlier round the corner by the market. I straighten my skirt and sit back down under the awning. You were with a young girl. My stomach knots and I bite the inside of my cheek, but still manage a lightness of tone. He sinks down into the seat, cramming his long legs uncomfortably under the table. His muscular thighs bring back memories. I toss my hair from side to side, teasing the fringe. I've grown my hair. What do you think? He gives it a cursory glance. Yeah, suits you. He doesn't mention the weight loss, suntan and flawless complexion, or my expensive outfit. It's taken time and effort, but I'm looking good. His mind is elsewhere. Either that, or he wants me to think it is, as he won't throw me any crumbs by engaging. Where? Where what? You said you spotted me earlier. Whereabouts? The French cheese stall. I point to the carrier bag by my feet. Camembert, Brie and Roquefort. Old favourites, eh? I tease. He'll remember the al fresco picnics on Hampstead Heath with the baguettes of French bread, the runny cheeses and chilled white wine. He might have tried to forget, but I'll not let him. Oh, is all he says. Are you OK? Perhaps a cool beer? It's so hot. My smile is wide, a bright, innocent beam. I run the back of my hand across my forehead, wiping away theatrical sweat. My treat. I can hear the cogs in his brain working, ratcheting up, click, click, click. The perspiration on his forehead might be from the heat, but there's definitely a frisson of fear about his demeanour. I snap my fingers at a hovering waiter. A bottle of Peroni? Scott doesn't humour me when I raise a questioning eyebrow, 
a knowing glint that this is his favourite tipple, especially in the heat. No thanks, water's fine. Still, please, he says, making his request directly to the waiter. Another glass of white wine for me, please. Sauvignon Blanc? I drain an almost empty glass and hand it across. I should have ordered a bottle. It's cheaper if you have more than two glasses. Beverly. The single word speaks volumes. I can hear Miss Evans using the same modus operandi when she threw out the single word names. Perhaps they're in cahoots. Yes, Scott? But I'm ready for him. My answers are carefully prepared. My sessions with Ms. Evans are helping with the manufacture of pertinent replies. What the hell are you doing here? You moved to Cornwall. Why are you back? An angry skiff of spittle spurts from his tight lips and lands on the table. I swish it away with the end of a serviette. I've moved back to London. Dad died, by the way, and left me the family home. I'm back in Southgate. I lower my eyes, teasing out a teardrop by squeezing my lids tightly together. It's better that Scott thinks I'm grieving, rather than know the truth. I want him to remember my soft side. He probably guesses that I feel no sadness, only relief, as I told him often enough about my childhood when we first got together. Never the really bad stuff, but enough to warrant sympathy to keep him close. Sorry, I didn't know. How could you? Our drinks arrive and I reach for the wine, sipping at the cool nectar. Anyway, Cornwall was a perfect haven after all the drama, but you didn't seriously expect me to stay there forever. It's miles from anywhere. God, this wine is good. Cheers. I raise my glass, then instantly regret the celebratory abandon as it seems to wind him up. Listen, I don't know what your game is, but keep away from me and Cassette. Cassette? Is that her name? She looks very young, even for you, but very pretty, I add. I'm warning you. One step in our direction and I'm going back to the police. You might have fooled them, but not me. Scott knocks back his water, coughing violently as he drains the glass and stands up. He glowers down at me using his height and vantage point to increase the threat level. Are you OK? I etch concern on my features. Listen, don't worry, Scott. I promise I'll not bother you. A deep breath. Actually, I've met someone else. A really nice guy who lives in London, and I think he could be the one. I hold up two fingers on both hands and wiggle them like inverted commas. You don't need to worry any more, I repeat. It's a minor victory. The tension slips a fraction from his broad shoulders. Whatever, I've got to go. Look after yourself. You too. It was great to bump into you. Without a second glance, he heads off the way he came. I watch his retreating back in its blue-striped work shirt, slim fit and clinging to his muscled torso. He'll have left his jacket at the bank, Barclays in Cheapside. He still works on the third floor in mergers and acquisitions. I used to tell him Perseverance would one day propel him up the building. The chairman of the bank has an office on the top floor, glass windows encircling a large private sanctum and affording panoramic views all around London. That'll be you one day, I said. Top floor, head of management. I lied, of course. Scott's too lazy. I could have helped him, but on his own, he'll always hover around the middle of the banking world, mediocrity swallowing him up. I spend another half an hour watching the world go by and savour the moment of victory. It's a good start, and it couldn't have gone any better. Scott's discomfort is only the beginning. After the discomfort and unease, there'll be the doubts and fears. Finally, I'll bang the nail firmly in his coffin and destroy any chance he might have of a happy ever after. It's the least he deserves. Miss Evans keeps hinting that I need to let go, but I wonder why. Turn the other cheek. Why? It doesn't work. It needs to be an eye for an eye. Only that 
will give me comfort. She doesn't really understand how deep it goes. I finish my drink, settle the bill, and pick up the cheeses before heading back towards the tube. My head is light from the drink, the sun, and the rendezvous. I sway like a listing ship, but soon surge forward full throttle, euphoric from the lunchtime events. However, I need to sober up and down a gallon of coffee when I get home before my date with Travis tonight. He is my project for the future and will never be allowed to treat me badly. Scott has certainly taught me a few never-to-be-repeated lessons. I smile, knowing Ms Evans would approve of my determination to move forward, although I'm certain she won't approve of Travis. Married men are definitely not going to be on her list of the ways forward for troubled patients, and I'm certain they'll not be recommended in the rule book. As I step onto the train, a warm thought tickles my imagination. I don't need to worry about not being able to have children anymore. Travis has two, a young boy and girl, and a ready-made family is becoming ever more appealing. As the doors slide shut, I realise that if everything works out as planned, I won't need to be defined any longer by a sterile womb. Chapter 4 Travis picked a seat in the corner and loosened his tie, pulling the tightened red knot to one side and running a finger inside the rim of his damp collar. The surgery's call telling him his blood pressure check was overdue had made him edgy. He ordered a bottle of white wine, a cold, crisp Sauvignon Blanc, and let his body sink into the cushioned armchair. Twenty minutes early, he'd have time to pop out for a quick roll-up before she arrived. The bar was a couple of streets away from his office. He'd been coming here for years, whining and dining clients through the boom times. The room was packed, buzzing with young, dynamic businessmen getting up close and personal with their secretaries, like he used to when selling marbled penthouses to fat oil shakes teased him with possibilities. He had imagined one day he'd be ensconced in such luxury, the playboy bachelor. But marriage had sucked him in, and now he barely earned enough to pay the mortgage. Boo! Guess who? Beverly's voice cut through the air, crisp and sharp, and made him squirm in his seat. Shit! Don't do that! You scared me to death! Her hands covered his eyes from behind, and a strong stench of perfume made him cough. You been here long? Jeez, it's busy. Don't you fancy somewhere quieter? Beverly scanned the room, peeled off her jacket, and pulled a chair up close. Ten minutes, give or take. Here. He handed her a full glass of white wine and watched her take a large swig. Cheers, she said, clanging their glasses together. Beverly could drink. In fact, she could drink him under the table. This had been their common ground in the early days, when her boundless energy and passion had intoxicated him. Now her suffocating intensity felt like a pillow was squashed against his face. I thought we'd have a couple here and then go to the French place next door for something to eat. It's quieter in there, he said. Sounds like a plan. But Travis didn't want quiet. He twiddled his thumbs in the office all day, and by evening was chomping for excitement. But arguing with Beverly wasn't worth the effort, certainly not now that he wanted to move on. She kept trying to pin him down, nail his apathy with sharpened tacks. Beverly's short black skirt rode up over her thighs, but he no longer felt the urge to slide his hand underneath and excite her below the table the way he used to. He'd prefer a cigarette. Top up, Beverly's cheeks flushed as she downed her glass. Yes, please. She wiggled her glass in the air like a winner's trophy in some speed-drinking competition. He lifted the bottle from the ice bucket. With his arm stretched out along the back of her chair, Travis watched as she quaffed the liquid and wondered where the allure had gone. The ducking and diving had only lasted a couple of months, and now Beverly was hanging on the end of a phone, the chase over. Then there was the matter of his wife, Queenie, whom he had no intention of leaving. At first he thought she was strong, a woman of substance, 
dealing with his peccadilloes in a mature and grown-up manner and putting the children first. But recently he'd twigged. It was because she didn't care. Most likely never had. He took a sip of his wine, then asked, How's the house coming along? Did you get your new carpets? Beverly's recently acquired wealth, however, caused Travis a dilemma. The detached house in Southgate was worth over two million pounds. Her father's guilt money, apparently. He'd crawled into his grave trying to buy salvation and forgiveness through the hefty bequest, and Beverly had willingly accepted. She wasn't one for scruples. Choked by his own mortgage, Travis viewed the wealth like a dangled carrot. It's taking forever, but what fun. When are you coming round? I'm getting it ready for us. She held her breath, stared him down. What about one night next week? Beverly's bust strained against her red shirt, and he felt a sudden urge to pull the sheer material apart, the wine egging him on. I'll check the diary tomorrow. Come here, you tease. Beverly pushed him away and stretched out her legs. Any night except Wednesday. What about Saturday? You promised. Early on, he'd promised a weekend date, but that was when he'd been desperate to get her into bed. Travis leant over and kissed her on the lips, slithering his tongue round to wet her earlobe. Let's see. I've other things on my mind at the moment. This is what we both want for now. She leant her heavy breasts in towards him, and as he clenched his teeth and closed his eyes, her hand landed near his crotch and slid back and forth. Come on, what about that meal? She suddenly sprang up, uncoiling like a taut spring, and shook the empty bottle. Look, it's all gone. Let's go. In frustration, he straightened his trousers, keen to come up with a way to bypass the expense of a meal and go straight to the hotel. He stood up and helped her on with her jacket. Whatever you say, boss. They pushed past the increasingly drunken workers, cheek by jowl at the bar, and made their way out onto the street. The summer night felt warm and balmy, but a smell like smoking ham hung in the air as a thick blanket of pollution furred the atmosphere. Travis coughed, his lungs thick with toxic deposits. He craved fresh air. Don't you just love London at night, the bustle and excitement? Beverly bounded along like a baby kangaroo, as if oblivious to the deadly poisons. She took his hand, interwove their fingers like a couple of young lovers. Travis suddenly pulled her into a small alleyway and pinned her up against a wall. Why don't we go straight to the hotel and eat afterwards? I don't know about you, but the food can wait. I've got much bigger things on my mind. He took her hand and guided it down to his crotch. See what I mean? The bigger the better. She squealed, took his hand and led him hurriedly back out onto the main street. I'm game. Vamoose. They walked briskly across London Bridge and Travis felt light-headed, his dull mood lifting. He'd worry about things later, but for now he'd go with the flow and one more night couldn't hurt. On either side of them, the Thames rumbled along past superficially lit banks. The sleeping behemoth snored gently, the dark, menacing undertones hidden from sight. I think I met your wife today. Travis had re-knotted his tie and tucked his shirt back into his suit trousers. It was only 9pm, but he was ready for bed. Weariness had set in after climax, and the alcohol had induced a post-coital downer, leaving him with a dry mouth and a gurgling growl in his stomach. It had been a long day, and he was ready for home, especially now the kids would be in bed. His open mouth choked back a lazy yawn. The fan clicked and whirred in the tiny bathroom, and Beverly's outline was visible through a crack in the door. Her pouting lips, like those of a pufferfish, were blood red where a steady hand had applied a thick coat of colour. Travis, his hands slick with sweat, sat on the edge of the bed as he struggled to tie the short laces on his hard leather shoes. What? Where? How did you know it was my wife? Beverly's face was pinned in close to the glass as a steady hand worked her makeup. Eyeliner, lip liner, blusher. Finally, 
She fluffed her hair with a weird, spiky metal comb. Travis got up, now fully dressed, and moved towards the bathroom, adrenaline pumping in his veins, and pushed open the door. Smell the perfume? Remember? Poison? Beverly upturned an outstretched wrist. They'd chosen it together, and he'd laughed when he first squirted it, whispering in her ear that she was its namesake. That was only six months ago. Christmas shopping on Oxford Street. My wife. You said you met her. Where? Waitrose. I took a trip there. You told me that's where your wife went, and right enough, there she was, by the fresh pineapples. How did you know it was her? You told me she liked pineapples. Beverly laughed, deep and throaty. Travis froze. He felt a sharp pain sear across his chest. Seriously? You didn't think I wouldn't Google her? Surely. That's what girlfriends do. Check out the competition. You don't mind, do you? I didn't speak to her, just followed her around to see what went into the trolley. Get a few tips. He closed his eyes against the stabbing pain, holding a hand to his chest and leant against the door jam. You definitely didn't speak to her. Beverly zipped up her makeup bag with one final check in the mirror and then turned to face him. Christ, she was baiting him, taunting him. She thought it was funny. The only thing I don't get is how she walks in those skyscraper heels. And no, I definitely didn't speak to her, so you can rest easy. You don't think I'm that stupid? Beverly's villainous chuckle followed him back into the bedroom. I'm starving. What's the name of the restaurant? French, I think you said. Hope it's good. Without waiting for a reply, she lifted her bag and clicked open the door. Come on, let's go. Travis followed her out, dragged along like muddied water in the wake of a ship's churning propellers. Beverly's gait was determined, and he suddenly remembered her lack of scruples. It mightn't be that easy to walk away. Tomorrow, he had two things to do. One, get his blood pressure checked, and two, work out how to get shot of Beverly. Chapter 5 Scott watched Beverly look up and down the street. He had piled the pizza boxes...